the march. The Empire's on the run. Alex Jones and the GCN Radio Network. Alex Jones here with a message to fellow freedom lovers. The prognosis for the entire planetary economic system runs from bad to worse. The globalist model is to shut down societies and starve patriots out until they acquiesce to the global takeover. That's why we've assembled the most vital and important preparedness items at InfoWarsShop.com. These are items that I did research on, that I personally use. You've got the life straw, so you can turn fetid water into safe water anywhere you go. The KTOR hand crank generator to charge up key equipment during power outages or out in the field. Strategic relocation, third edition by Joel Skousen. When disaster strikes by Matthew Stein. Therosafe used by Homeland Security to protect yourself during any radiological event. Hand crank shortwave AM FM radios. Everything that we've researched and found to be the best is available at InfoWarsShop.com and your purchase makes our InfoWar possible. We're getting prepared. Are you? InfoWarsShop.com the globalist social engineers are not just targeting us with propaganda. They are manipulating our genetics. We are being targeted at every level by estrogen mimickers that lower our testosterone and other hormones and natural compounds that the body needs. After consulting top doctors, nutritionists, pharmacists, and others, we have developed what I believe is the ultimate non-GMO organic super male vitality formula sourced from powerful organic herbs and then concentrated for maximum potency. Super Male Vitality was developed to activate your body's own natural processes instead of using synthetic chemicals. Super Male Vitality by InfoWars Life is so powerful that I only take half the recommended dose. For a limited time, we are offering 15% off Super Male Vitality at InfoWarsLife.com to introduce you to this powerful supplement. Visit InfoWarsLife.com today to secure your Super Male Vitality. InfoWarsLife.com in the last 50 years, iodine has been phased out of our staple foods and replaced with the halogen bromine, a practice now banned in nations around the world. Guess what else is in the halogen family? Fluoride. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Jones here. In 1924, the federal government did the right thing and encouraged salt producers to add iodine. It's the good halogen on the periodic table. And the results are on record, reports documented, a 15-point IQ increase in areas that had previously been deficient in iodine. Bottom line, iodine is important. Unbound, clean, in a glycerin base, nascent iodine was the answer for myself and my family. You will find Survival Shield nascent iodine exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com. InfoWars Life Survival Shield nascent iodine isn't just for emergencies. I take it every day. That's InfoWarsLife.com or call toll-free 888-253-3139. take you live to the Central Texas Command Center in the heart of the resistance. It's Alex Jones. All right, we got 30 minutes left with the head of the DailyCaller.com, Tucker Carlson. He's also uh, one of the main hosts on Fox News. You can catch him there with his commentary and also doing the news on the weekends. And of course, he's been on CNN. Uh, he's been on MSNBC, you name it, and he's here with us right now. Of course, he does not have the customary bow tie. Why did you get rid of the bow tie? I joined the mainstream, Alex. I'm just like everyone else. No, if you wear a bow tie, it's like a middle finger around your neck. You're just inviting scorn and ridicule. Louis Farrakhan. Yeah. I totally, well, you know, and I, obviously, I don't mind scorn and ridicule, but I, I work in New York and a lot every week, so I have to walk through Penn Station, and the number of people screaming the F word at me, it just got, it wore me down after a while, so I just gave in and became conventional. Where you got told off for wearing a bow tie? Literally every day. People will scream obscenities at you. If you wear a bow tie, just try it. Wear a bow tie for a week. Just walk down, you know, go to down anywhere in Texas, wear a bow tie. But see, see, I don't wear a bow tie. I, I have 50 calibers, <laughs> just weapons laying around. Well, you're everywhere. heavily armed, so no one's going to yell at you. But I'm not. No, 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 no. We, we, just, we just like to openly have our guns. Kind of like the socialist openly say your kids belong to us. We're going to take over and take your guns. We just say, oh, yeah, here are our guns. 
to flaunt them in their face to try to acclimate them to liberty. I love that about Texas. I, I grew up with guns. I grew up hunting uh, from a really young age. And I don't know anybody who's safer around guns and more responsible with guns than people who grew up around guns. Well, you're a, you, I mean, you are like a Uber man, like Putin or something, coming down to Texas just to hunt. Of course. I, lo I absolutely love Texas. If I could make a living here, I would live here. My kids, I, we have relatives in Texas, and my kids were on, two of my kids were on uh, their ranch last week, and they came back. We're moving to Texas. You know, everyone's nice. The food is great. You can shoot. You can fish. I mean, it's just, it's fantastic. Well, we need you because all the socialist Democrats from the cities they've imploded, like Los Angeles, are moving here. I know. And, and they're literally turning Austin into California. Well, this is what happened to Vermont. This is what happened to Maine. It's what happened to New Hampshire. I mean, you, you had these kind of sturdy independent states that were flooded by refugees from states they destroyed, like New York and Massachusetts. And then they, they spread the virus, you know, to the, the, to the pristine states, which are now kind of depressing a little. And that's not rhetoric. They literally do it. Put up a wall, baby. I'm, I'm serious. I gave that advice to friends of mine in New Hampshire, in Manchester, New Hampshire, 15 years ago. But now it's too late. Now New Hampshire is moving in that direction. Vermont is like, you know, Bulgaria. I mean, it's unbelievable. Vermont was always a, you know, small government. I don't know, right winger. It wasn't ever right wing, but it was always, you know, pro Second Amendment. Get out of my business. You know, I'm doing what I do. You can do what you do. We're not going to bother each other kind of state. And now it's this overweening nanny state run by super annoying people from other places. And they come like locusts from the area they've already wrecked. And they're aggressive. They're totally in your face. Like, I have a lot of problems trying to impose my views on other people. Like, I don't even with my kids, I don't lecture my kids at the table. I don't lecture people at, you know, my kids' school. I don't not bother. Oh, no, they will come up and lecture my wife that we've got too many children. Oh, no, literally. They are relentless and totally without shame. They, I believe in this. Well, they call it nudging. It's, well, exactly. like, it's like pecking like a hen. There's, to me, a huge separation between my personal life and politics. I don't want to obsess over politics. I want to chase my wife around the house in an amorous way. I want to play with my kids. I want to have a normal life. Politics is worth getting involved in in order to create the space for a normal life. That's right. You have to fight them or they'll take over. Exactly. But they never stop. Ever. They never stop with their political views. And when they come to your state, I'm talking about liberals here, um, you know, some of them are nice, but I mean, they're just, they just want to control you. And I don't want to be controlled, and nor do I want to control other people. I hate telling other people what to do. I really do. No, that's the worst part of my job. It's not fun. But people that love liberty don't want to be the boss. People that are into con control, they want to be boss. A hundred percent. And that's one of the reasons why it's an asymmetrical battle. That in the end, the authoritarians have the advantage because they are willing to break eggs to make omelets, you know, whereas people like me aren't. Looking at Piers Morgan, he never really imploded because he took over Larry King's slot that was already going down. And it went from 2 million viewers down to a half million viewers down to 400,000 viewers. And the lecturing and all of it, but I see that as a bellwether of, of a rejection of globalism, a rejection of the nanny state lecturing uh, people that he is so hated. I mean, when I blew up at him, they put that on every channel in the country, and it just re-aired this week again. I didn't give myself credit for it, but a lot of mainstream media gave me credit for kind of being the bellwether of the, the, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back of Piers Morgan, I guess, being sent packing back to England. What is your take on him and, and the whole phenomenon of like he was Obama or something? They put everything behind him, promoted him, gave him every big guest, still fell right on his face. The dogs won't eat the dog food, as they say in the political business. You can you can roll out the biggest ad campaign ever, but if they won't eat it, you're not selling any. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, I think in the end, he just didn't put on a very interesting or appealing show. I think the gun control stuff was alienating to a lot of people because it should, even if people agreed with him, he clearly didn't understand America. He didn't understand that guns for Americans are not just some affectation, not just some, you know, symbol. They are integral to our country, to our freedom. Earlier you said that it's baked in. It's baked into the cake that is America, absolutely. And he just, he didn't get that. And boy, was he arrogant, really, really arrogant. I loved your exchange with him. Um, I, I have to say I was rooting for you. Well, thank you. But, but I mean, that should have been an example for him that for two weeks he had a rating spike after that because there was something real on there, not just a bunch of pinheaded perseveration. Well, and, and Piers Morgan, you know, we, was no Larry King. I worked at CNN when, for years, five or six years when Larry King was there. And people always said, Larry King's stupid. Really? I knew Larry King pretty well. Not stupid at all. One thing about Larry King, he actually listened to 
two other people. You'd, he'd have on guests. He would ask them interesting, evocative questions. Well, if you heard his radio show back in the day, and I've actually gone in online and heard some of the old shows, he was he's really smart. He's re he's really smart, and he was good at getting interesting stuff. It's like Howard Stern, one of the great interviewers ever. I thought you had a great interview on that on his show. Oh, he is good. He gets the cool stuff out from his guest, whereas Pierce Morgan, I always felt, was just interested in talking about himself and his friends and his stupid opinions and had this obnoxious accent. I love the idea of him being sent back to cold, fog-covered, unhappy, pasty white England. I would feel weird if I lived in England and had a primetime TV show lecturing them all day, telling them that they, you know, had bad <laughs> dental work or something. I know, going, becoming an anti-tea activist or attacking, you know, the queen or something. It's not your country, you know? Well, that's what Jay Leno told him behind the scenes, because I was told by Jay's people. He said, look, stop lecturing people about our politics. It's not going to work. You're going to be... Jay Leno is a good guy. I worked at MSNBC for four years, and I did something obnoxious on, well, many things obnoxious on my show. And one time, Jay Leno came, came to my office and said, you know, we're not great friends or anything, but he said, I just want to give you a piece of advice. What you just did was, you shouldn't have done that. You look like a jerk. And I said, why are you telling me this? He said, because I, I like you, and I'm just giving you advice. And he was right. That guy's a nice guy who goes out of his way to Yeah, help. I was told he did that to Piers Morgan. Yes, I'm sure he did because he's that kind of person. And and Piers Morgan, too, where I was smart enough to take Jay Leno's advice. I think you get advice from someone who's survived. You know, the word is they got rid of him because he, he did those Obama jokes. Sorry, go I'm ahead. sure that's exactly right. I mean, look, what other... I don't understand the reasoning. I mean, again, this is like, he's a rich guy. He'll be totally fine. Whatever, he'll wind up somewhere else. But think about this. NBC fired him because he was... First in his time slot? How does Have you ever heard twice they fired him? And both times he was number one in his time slot. When does that happen in broadcasting? They tried to bury him and then it, 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 it worked still, so they just got rid of it. Because he's unpopular with people in you know New York and L.A., but everyone else seemed to like him. I like Jay Leno. Anyway, it's, it tells you that it's not a meritocracy. I mean, you think that TV rewards people who are the most successful, but look at Piers Morgan, the fact that he hung That's on That's where I was going, is that it shows how rigged it is. They care about the politics and the trillions they'll control. It isn't even about the ratings, but then they still lose the audience. That's what the establishment doesn't get. Yes. I mean, when they program the people they put, I'm not, and I'm no genius, but it's unwatchable now what's on CNN and MSNBC. Yes. Dylan Radigan has the high time slot because he's ranting and raving about both parties being bad, so they don't renew his contract. They don't want real people in there. It's I don't know what the hell they want. I mean, presumably they want to succeed. They have shareholders who are demanding profits. You would think they would make wise market-based decisions, but they don't. They paid Christian Amanpour, the host of the Sunday show on ABC. I don't think her husband wants to listen to her talk, much less viewers. Like I don't, some kind of lecturing vampire. It was bizarre. It was bizarre. And they had a, they should have, Jake Tapper would have been, it would have been great. No, they have put Christian Amanpour because she was friends with the wife of the president of the, of the network. I mean, that's not a smart way to make. Decisions. No, it shows it's total elite cliques that are disconnected like Marie Antoinette from, we talked about Drudge in this great taped interview that's going to air in a couple days on the nightly news. But, but getting back to that, I remember him a decade ago on C-SPAN well, I mean, you were talking about it, uh, saying you're all gone, you're not going to have jobs, it's over. And, and, of course, he's been proven right now. Completely. I sat there in the audience in 1998 at the National Press Club as he told the reporters assembled that they were working for dying news organizations. And by the way, they laughed at him because at the time, the Washington Post had a flat-out monopoly, and so did all the papers, LA Times. They were making, they were a wash in cash. Their reporters are flying first class on assignment. Why is Drudge such a visionary? Drudge is a visionary because he follows his own instincts. There's no board of directors at Drudge. If Drudge thinks it's interesting and thinks his readers will think it's interesting, he puts it up and he does it instantly. And he has an unerring sense, an unerring instinct for things that are interesting. He has a mix. Drudge takes his page. It's, a, you know, it's technology from 20 years ago. And it's still the most compelling thing on the internet because he takes it and he tells a story with other people's headlines. It's brilliant. If you want to know Drudge's view of America, read the Drudge Report every day. Don't even click on a headline. Just read the headline. And it gives you a gestalt, a snapshot exactly. of what's going on. Exactly. And it's, Drudge is some of his obsessions, and I think it's fair to call them that, things he's really interested in. He's been interested in for 20 years, but only now seem relevant. For instance, weather. Drudge was always focused on the weather. I never cared about the weather. All of a sudden, weather is like something that we're really concerned about. NSA spying. NSA spying, exactly. The privacy stuff. People 15 years ago said, boy, that Drudge is a little bit paranoid about the government spying on us. 
Well, it turns out he was prescient, not paranoid. He was absolutely right. Well, listen, 15 years ago, I had stickers over my laptops. People, you know, the family would laugh at me. And now it comes out. We over know. the camera on your laptop?